Hello, I'm Citrus, and back in February, uh, I bought this, which is the Hot Wheels RC Nissan Z. Now, Hot Wheels been doing these for a few years, but uh, this was the first one that I've seen that personally interested me because I like the car, so I bought it. Uh, these retail for like $25, but I picked it up for about $18 with a discount. And um, here it is. Here's the car. A little uh, USB charging lead and a somewhat plasticky cheap feeling kind of controller it takes two double A's in there um, and the double A's are just for the controller the car has its own uh, little I think lithium cell inside of it and um, yeah I messed with it a little bit and um, it's not bad so it's rear wheel drive only but you can see here from the front, it's a solid axle. So it's actually just a uh, skid steer type of thing. And you can see, uh, although like the sculpting has all the detail in there, there's very, very little paint on the whole car. Like if we compare it to a uh, Hot Wheels Z. Uh, granted, this is a premium car, but you know, it does look quite a bit nicer. And you can also see that the proportions are a little odd. Um, it's much narrower than it probably should be, but anyway. So I was playing with this for a little bit, and I was thinking, you know, surely there has to be, like, a better version or a better take on this concept, right? And then I remembered that there is. So I went on to a magical place called eBay, and I bought them. And then I bought some more and some more and then some more and then some more. So this will be my somewhat comprehensive guide or retrospective or whatever you want to call it of zip zaps. So what exactly are zip zaps? They're 164 scale remote control cars. 164 scale in uh, big quotes. Um, but it's about the size of basically a, uh, you know, a Hot Wheel, Matchbox, Tomica kind of car with some exaggerated proportions to, you know, make them all fit on the same chassis. The research has been a little bit difficult for this because, you know, there was a huge community of people who collected and customized and raced these back in the day, but, uh, you know, link rot being what it is, quite a lot of those resources have been lost to time. Now, these products, I believe, came out first in 2001, and they were sold in some flavor uh, up until, I think, at least 2009 uh, in my memory. I believe the original retail price of the uh, regular Zip Zaps was about $20, and the Zip Zaps SEs were $30. Um, and I'll throw the numbers up on the screen with what that is adjusted for inflation today. Um, although, even back then, you could very often find them on discount for, like, I think, 5 to $10 off half price, basically. In 2003, I had a uh, Zip Zaps SE Mustang concept car. Uh, it was pretty cool. But, you know, over the last 20 years or so, it somehow disappeared into the ether, as a lot of, you know, childhood toys tend to do as you move through life. So one immediate question might be, in the year 2024, can you still have fun with these 20-year-old toys? And the answer is yes. Some of you may also be familiar with a product called Micro Sizers. Um, and this is a uh, product that is also known as Bitchargy, so Hobbyco, uh, outside of Japan, licensed the toy from Tomy, who made the Bitchargy, and they released, I think, almost all of the same products, uh, although there were some uh, special edition-like sets uh, that were only available in Japan and were not exported. Um, so this is the Automodelista set, and uh, this was also released in Japan. Some of you may know Automodelista as either a very crap or very good racing game. Um, I won't comment on it since I haven't played before, but I bought it because the set looked really nice and I thought this would be an interesting comparison to a uh, first-gen Zip Zap because they're actually quite similar. All right, so here's a microsizer next to a original Zip Zap. 
Uh, they both come in two flavors, the 27 and 49 megahertz version, so you can run two cars simultaneously. The remotes are functionally the same, both have a uh, extending antenna, like so. The microsizers controller runs on two AA batteries, and the zip zaps run on two AAAs. Both have uh, digital steering and acceleration, so just on, off in both directions, and both controllers charge their respective cars. You can see even the charging point locations are exactly the same. The difference being that on the Zip Zaps controller, you have to release the car after you're done charging, whereas on the microsizers, you just yank it off afterwards. And a comparison of the shells. So you have two shells of the same car, so you can kind of compare the uh, ways that the molds differ. You can see that the Zip Zaps shell is substantially longer, um, which allows for a slightly more accurate representation of the design of the cars. And I personally like these kinds of, uh, the Zip Zaps proportions a little bit more. Um, the Microsizer shells do look good, but once they are put onto the chassis, the wheels are extremely large. Um, if I just show you real quick. And I think it just kind of looks a little bit off. The fact that the front wheels are smaller than the rear, um, you know, kind of mirrors like the Tomy Choro Q thing, but like, I'm just not the biggest fan of it. I would say that the paint and detail quality is uh, pretty similar. Although, of course, the Zip Zaps one has leg up in terms of having details like the mirrors, wipers, and uh, a little bit more paint on the body, like in turn indicators and stuff like that. Architecturally, the Microsizer and the Zip Zap are very similar. So both of them um, have no uh, on-off switches on the car itself. They're basically just on all the time. Um, you have a steering trim adjustment here in the front. The same kind of uh, suspension slash steering mechanism in the front as well. Left and right is activated by a magnet that pulls it basically one way or the other. And over here on the microsizer, you can see there is no spring for the suspension, but there is a spring on the zip zap. And in exchange, the uh, microsizer chassis has like a control bar that goes left and that basically limits the movement of either wheel and on the zip zap there isn't a bar so both of them can move independently however you can see that the uh, holes for a bar do exist which means you can either take the bar from microsizers and their accessory packs and put them in here or uh, you can also buy certain zip zaps accessory sets that come with those bars so more holes, I guess, means that the bars are softer and a bit more bendy. Um, this particular set is a uh, Fast and Furious set that includes a Mitsubishi Eclipse and a Mazda RX-7. The drivetrain of the cars are also identical. You have a motor in the back in a cradle uh, with a counter gear, and then that drives another gear that is directly connected to the axle. Now you do see that the motor on the uh, microsizer is missing and there's a very good reason for that so here's the motor that is included with the microsizer it is identical in size to uh, a motor from a zip zap and you would just pop it in like that and then there is a little metal cover with hooks that go onto that little metal bar right there and then there's supposed to be a piece of plastic on the chassis that the motor cover would clip or snap into and on this one it is just gone like that little bit of plastic is not in the box anywhere so i can only surmise that this is actually quite a fragile design that little piece of plastic would also be the tab on the rear that would hold the body in place so <laughs> yeah it's just not a very good design especially because uh the motors are designed to be interchangeable which means if you are, I don't know, customizing your car at all, you'll probably be opening up this piece a lot. So on the Zip Zap, 
um, the cover being screwed down and also with a like metal thread inside of the plastic is much, much better design. Now inside uh, the actual car, uh, you can remove this cover with no tools, basically. You just need to um, shimmy it forward a little bit, push up, and it comes right off. You'll also need to unhook the antenna wire from this little clip right there so to prevent it from snagging and ripping itself off the board. But that doesn't matter in this case because uh, the corrosion, as you can see, has basically eaten all of the wires and their connections to the rest of the car. Only one of the very, very, very thin copper wires that controls the magnets for steering are still there. Um, you can see that half of the contact on the positive end of the battery holder is also gone. Uh, the original batteries that came in microsizers and bit chargees is nickel cadmium, and I don't know if they ever changed the type of battery that goes inside, but the corrosion damage on the inside of this is absolutely horrendous compared to uh, what it was like in this particular zip zap when I replaced the battery. And um, when we open up one of these, we're actually going to be replacing a battery on a new one that I haven't touched yet. And just to really show you what I'm talking about, so these are the batteries of um, that I've pulled out of the car so far. Uh, and this unlabeled one is actually one of the replacement batteries that came that I bought, but it already was corroding in the package, which was kind of sad. But yeah, this is so this is the Tomy battery that you can see. Um, this came out of the microsizer. And that is a piece of the metal contact that is still stuck to it. Uh, basically just corroded it right through the, all the metal. And uh, this one right here on the right, from GP, as you can see, is nickel metal hydride, same size, uh, and you know it's still rotten, but it's not nearly as bad. So this battery size is uh, called one third triple A, and you'll really want to have the uh, flat top batteries with no like button on the end. Uh, you can tell that the positive side is positive because of the notch inside of the battery all the way around. So the original Tomy battery is 50 milliamp hours and the Zip Zap's uh, nickel metal hydride battery is 100 milliamp hours. But the batteries that you can get today are closer to like 150, 170. Um, I've seen people talk about 200 milliamp hour uh, one third AAA batteries, but I haven't been able to find them on my own. So yeah, you'll get considerably more charge time with uh, new batteries that you'll get these days. So basically opening up a brand new uh, zip zap. The only thing I've done so far is take off the tape that secures the top shell to the rest of the box. Uh, and I had to do that anyway because the shell for this was utterly crushed in the mail on its way to me. So I kind of tried to tape it back together enough so that at least, well, it stays on and it holds everything inside. Once we open it, we get the, the body of the car. So there have been a couple of instances where I bought these shells and the uh, paint has basically started sweating. Um, all you have to do is basically wash it off in a mild soapy detergent. And uh, once you get that all off, you can buff the windows again with like a buffing block or something like that, and they'll be nice and clear. This was a victim of that. And you can see it's not sticky anymore. Um, and you can see that the uh, windows are still a little bit foggy uh, compared to, you know, this one, which is just fine. But, uh, you know, you can still clean them pretty well. Not too bad. Getting into the rest of the package, pull it out. Uh, on this side, you have a little tiny screwdriver that goes into the controller, like so. You can see it comes out like that. Stays inside pretty well, 
and this is the flathead you'll use to uh, secure the motor into place. Although, if you have a regular screwdriver, I much recommend using that because they're just so much more comfortable to use. And once we lift this up, we have a little data card about the car that we just bought. Some of the cards also come with a bit of lore about the character or the car itself, which is pretty interesting. Get a wrist strap for the controller so you don't drop it. And a very big sheet of fold out instructions, um, which has some basic information about how the car works, uh, how to put it together, how to troubleshoot some things, and some information about possible ways you can change performance. And we'll talk about that in a minute too. And after slicing the tape open, you can open this part. Uh, be careful when moving the controller because it's very easy to also like knock everything else out of the tray. Because in here quite firmly. On the back of the controller, you can see a little number that indicates the uh, product that it belongs to. Right there, you see it is 607012 which is the same as the uh, barcode, or the product code on the barcode, which is, well, 67012. There's also a sticker on the bottom. Uh, I don't know what that really corresponds to, but if you open the battery cover of the controller, you'll find a sticker number the same. So we'll set this aside. Okay, so this is the chassis as it comes out of the box with the antenna wrapped around. Uh, and that's interesting. Okay, so the suspension control bar is here, but you can see that the steering knuckles do not have springs on them. So this, I guess being an earlier uh, ZipSaps product, has basically has actually the identical um, steering mechanism as the uh, microsizers. The other one that I was showing you earlier you can see is a later product, so 7046, and it does have springs. So I suppose this was a uh, product revision that Radio Shack made at some point. Before we actually take the cover off, we should put the motor in so that we can test uh, to make sure everything is working correctly before we button everything back up. So take the motor cover, hook it on, put the motor in, bring the cover down over it, and try very hard to look through the camera. Okay. All right, and that's the motor installed. After clearing off the adhesive, we can just gently pry cover off. Okay, so that's that side freed. Do the same on the other side. You wanna be as careful as you can to not break these tabs because there's basically nothing else really holding the cover onto the chassis. Okay, you don't need to really uh, slide the antenna off of the cover, but, uh, oh, looks like this time the antenna wasn't even clipped in, so that's fine. And we just need to lift the board very carefully up and out of the way. And you can see there's a very fine wire that we don't want to damage. So I'm gonna do this off camera, but I'm basically going to very gently pr move the wire away so that I don't get into uh, I don't accidentally break it while trying to maneuver the battery out as well. The annoying thing is that you have these two battery uh, wires for the motor that go on top of the battery. So you kind of have to just move things around very gently until you have a clear path for the battery to come out of the car. All right, so what I've done is uh, pulled the wires, you can see this way, towards the po uh, away from the camera towards the positive terminal. So now the battery is completely exposed. And to help you get it out, you can actually see the battery um, a little bit through this middle notch there. You can see the green through the hole. And you can help uh, use that to push the battery out from the bottom. You can see it moving there. And then once it started shifting, you can also try to catch it on the lip of the shell, uh, the wrapper. And once it's free, just gently... Ugh. And there you go. You can see inside there is a little bit of corrosion as you would expect 
on the positive terminal there. Uh, looks like the negative is pretty clean this time, which is very fortunate. And to clean that up, all you need, splash of vinegar and a Q-tip. I've already used this to clean another um, zip zap earlier. So you just get the tip wet with the vinegar and uh, stick it in there. And let the vinegar do its job. And you can pretty much see that it's uh, clean already. Once you've cleaned it up to a satisfying degree, you can stick a dry end of a Q-tip in there to just dab up the excess. And then you'll want to uh, push the contacts forward a little bit just to make sure that the new battery will make very good contact. Um, corroded batteries do swell a little bit, so if it's been in the car for a long time, it may have pushed the contacts out of shape slightly. All right, now we take our new battery and basically just do the exact opposite of what we have just done and slip it inside the car. And there we go, that is seated. Okay, so let's put some batteries inside the controller and test our work. So these are just some uh, cheapo Ikea batteries I have. There are um, newer rechargeable AAAs that you can buy that have um, much more capacity than these. Okay, and if we, oh. The switch is already on, so okay. So at least the switch, the controller powers on, which is good. Uh, let's open it and stick the chassis onto the controller. Hmm, that's not a good sign. So now we're going to take this other 27 megahertz controller. You can see this is 607046 and turned it on. And let's see if it will accept the car. Okay, so now you can see even though I haven't done anything else to the battery inside of the car, it is now charging. Steering seems to work. And the... And it's going. Ooh. So here's a problem with the cars not having um, off switches. So by the yellow antenna, you also know that this is a, another 27 megahertz car. If you have multiple cars of the same frequency and because they have no off switches, so you can't turn them off, then if you use a controller, they will both run. So uh, I guess be very sure to store your other cars of the same frequency, if you even happen to have multiple, um, out of range from each other when you're using them. So now that we know that our work is correct, let's put the whole car back to together. So first we want to uh, take the antenna wire and hook it in that way that uh, if we tug on this at all from the outside of the car, it won't um, do any damage internally. All right, there's the wire in place seat the board you know i thought this would be a bit easier to do since i have experience building model kits with a camera in my face um but it's really not helping now on the bright side um if one of your one of the little catches on the cover do break like this one is about to uh, it's not too big of a deal because you can always just secure the clear cover to the rest of the chassis by just wrapping a thin band of tape all the way around and then uh, just cutting the tape off when you need to access the car uh, internals again for whatever reason. So now let's put on the counter gear and then snap in the rear axle. Next we can equip the rims okay and lastly the tires so this is a little bit uh, scary possibly 
Um, I've generally had pretty good luck with the tires that have come with the cars, but I did run into my first um, breakage today, and I will show you that in a second. So on this one, you can see one of the uh, tires has stretched out, and the other one had hardened so much that it basically shattered as soon as I had tried to take it out of the box. Um, these all feel fine, so I think I will be able to use them, hopefully. Yeah, they, yeah they're not too bad yet. And unfortunately, you do just kind of have to stretch them over the wheel, like so. And just make sure that it goes over uh, the middle, I don't know what we call it, the rib. Okay, and just uh, spin them around a little bit, make sure that they're all on properly. Okay, and we're ready to put the shell on. So I have to thread the antenna through the hole, gently pull it through. Oh, clip that back onto the board there. And I find that it's usually easier to uh, stick the rear tab in place first and then um, ease the front in. And there you go. That is the shell attached. And then with our one working controller, which we can turn on right here, It's working. So um, the controllers, like I said, do tend to be a little bit iffy. For example, this one has no problems with left and right and reverse, but uh, forwards is not always the best, but it still does work most of the time. So that's the uh, regular zip zaps, but what about the zip zap SE? So here you can see the controller is completely different. And now instead of taking just two triple A's, it takes a whopping four. Uh, so that's kind of good because it means that uh, you can, you know, get a lot more charges out of the car before you have to change batteries in the controller. Uh, but part of it is also because, well, these take up a lot more power. So there's your batteries. They go inside like that. On the back, you have this little screwdriver and a neutral adjustment for the trigger for accelerate or reverse. Um, since this is like a pistol grip kind of controller, uh, it's also left and right hand adjustable. So right now it's right-handed. So uh, this is accelerate, this is reverse, and you can push that switch to reverse to reverse that and have it be the other way around so that this is accelerate and this is reverse. This is left and right and there's your on-off switch and your six selectable channels. Um, the car itself, here you go, and you can compare it to a Tomica FCRX7. So detail is not too bad. If it'll focus, about the same amount of paint apps. Um, yeah, and I think the uh, you know proportions are not too bad. So aside from the upgraded controller, well, how different is the car? You have proportional acceleration and steering. Uh, I believe it's like four or five steps for both. Uh, so it's not like, you know, perfectly like analog or linear or whatever, but you know, it's a lot better than just having on off steering and acceleration. So as a result, uh, the ZipSaps SEs are much more controllable. Zip zaps, uh, these also have a um, on off switch. So we can turn it on. And these cars automatically default to channel one. So if you want to run it on a different channel 
when you turn on the car and the controller, you have to uh, basically dock the car first in order to, ooh, what's it doing? Uh, in order to have it write the channel to the car. So while the controller is doing the writing, uh, the light will blink red. And now that it's solid red, it's showing that the car is charging, which means that the programming has completed successfully. If the programming fails, the light will be amber. OK, and the car is ready. So now we can release it. And I can show you how it works. So if you uh, pull on the trigger, you can see that's the speed. And then there is the steering. OK. And the uh, shells now come with headlights and taillights, which, oper which turn on when the car moves. So accelerate and reverse. Really neat. This one you'll see is a, uh, ooh, let's get in there. Okay, this is a much later release, so you see 607050. Um, and this chassis is not the one that originally came with this car. So if we look at this, this is the box that the uh, FC came in originally. And you see it is actually 7026. Um, and uh, it turns out that there were quite a few hardware revisions when it came to SE cars, especially in how the this how the steering is physically wired. Um, these bodies only have two wires going from the board to the steering servo, whereas uh, on some versions of these, there was at least three wires. So you see here my notes from my tested at low motor voltage and can't code to other channels. So the car was. Uh, this one was permanently stuck on channel one. It will run on channel one, but that's it. And you also can never tell the charging status because even though the controller will charge the car while it's in an error state, uh, it won't go back to green ever. So you can't tell how long you know the car is supposed to have been charging for. Um, and the low motor voltage thing. Uh, so with 34,000 RPM motor, the, the car barely ran at all. Um, it would only run with the basically like the weak motor and the performance 21.5 motor and that's it like and when they ran they ran at basically the same speed so that tells me that maybe even the 25,000 rpm motor was not getting enough voltage to be able to spin at the speed that it was supposed to so that's this one the fd3s that i have here you can see uh, there is the box and the car, uh, 7032, so slightly later. Um, also didn't work at all. The steering was uh, completely seized on the chassis, so it cannot turn. Like It is permanently stuck at that angle, and I cannot get the servo to even rotate by hand at all. Um, it was quite terrifying. And um, the, like, the motor wiring had... Uh, basically corroded. And uh, you can see inside the box there, and I will take this out and show you since this is the more broken one, just what the inside of the car is like. When I tested it, like you can hear something inside attempting to turn the steering servo, but it just was not move at all. When it comes to SEs, uh, the later ones are definitely better. So the two that I have actually with shells on them outside um, are this which is the uh, Dodge Viper up here. Very nice. Um, and this one is 7053. And the one under the FC RX-7 uh, belonged to this Ford GT, which is 7050. The later revisions are I don't necessarily know if the hardware itself is more reliable somehow, but the fact that they have, uh, you know, marginally later production dates means that they're at least less time for the corrosion to have damaged the car. So that's one consideration. So to illustrate, uh, 
how to get into an SE, you can see that the cover is gone because there is now a slot for the uh, harness from the shell to plug into the chassis to get power for the lights. Now you can obviously um, disconnect the harness and uh, the car will still work and you will get a little bit more runtime out of the battery per charge since uh, it's not spending any more power to um, turn the lights on. The chassis comes like this with the uh, antenna wrapped around the rear axle, which is a little bit scary to me. You can also see that the antenna wire is now much, much thinner. This is the uh, FD RX-7 shell, and you can see that like, the steering will not turn. If I just take the uh, working one, for example, see, the steering turns very easily. You have to take off two screws, one here and one here. At some point, there were some revisions um, because you can see this one, the front screw is very, very small um, and the rear one is a little bit larger. On later models, these two screws are both the same. So you take off the rear one first, be careful not to lose it. And then there's a little catch here that basically is for, uh, well, holding down the rear of the board and to secure the antenna in place so it doesn't get ripped off of the board. The connection is right there, and you want to be very careful to not yank the antenna off. And then just turn on, uh, turn the front screw off as well. Okay. And then after that, uh, you can leave this thing, this little bracket in place, it doesn't really need to come off. And after that, you can just gently lift the board up and out of the way. And there is the battery compartment. So there is a very specific battery that um, these cars use. There is a battery size called a half AAA that exists, theoretically, um, but I have never been able to find one. And I'll show you what the battery looks like. So th this is the battery that comes out of the car. Uh, you can see it's 2.4 volts, 70 milliamp hours, and it's called a 7 AAA HR2A. Well, they call it a perfect replacement. See, it replaces 7 AAA HR2A, but they don't quite fit exactly. Uh, and I don't know why, because, you know, you think that the component cells are the same, but th these batteries are very, very, very slightly larger. Um, there's another video that I'll link to in the description that does a very in-depth uh, walkthrough of how to replace a battery in these cars. And in that video, the guy actually cuts away part of the chassis uh, right here in order to allow this battery to fit in there more easily. Fortunately, I've actually been able to just um, fit them into the car just by kind of jamming it in. And it does fit. And uh, you can see the shell also fits uh, over the chassis still. But uh, from some angles, you can clearly tell that the, uh, the body is being like forced apart very slightly. So I chose to do that just because I didn't want to cut up anything and risk, you know, damaging the contact from the outside when I cut my way in. And so, yeah, but the actual battery is you can kind of see through the wrapper it's two uh quarter triple a cells stacked together no matter what i tried looking for i could not find a like just this actual battery under any name other than just this one this uh dantona battery so you're kind of stuck buying this which you know does technically fit but it's not great it's not a perfect replacement and you know on the bright side it does work so you can have well in my opinion arguably the superior platform and you know still keep it running 20 years on now what if we want to customize them well as with so many toys from the uh i don't know late 90s early 2000s there are accessories, and I mean a lot of accessories. So I already mentioned that you can get um, option kits like this, which come with two shells. These actually also come with uh, wings that you can interchange on the bodies 
two sets of tires, which is really important because you don't know if the uh, tires that actually come with the car are gonna be any good. So at least when you buy a set like this, you get two more chances to have good matching tires. Uh, believe it or not, the treads actually do matter. So there are three patterns. You have these, which the uh, products call like factory tires, and you have all season tires and then sport tread tires. So uh, let's open this one up and show you what the difference is. The easiest way I find is to just uh, do a this. There we go. So this is the all season tire. Um, that's a tread pattern on it. And this uh, over here is the sport tire, which has basically no tread at all, kind of like a racing slick. Um, you do see there is a bit of a flash. So and it kind of doesn't matter too much because after you drive the car a little bit, it'll wear down on its own, especially depending on the kind of surface that you're driving the car on. But you may want to take a knife to it and just shave off the little excess a little bit. I didn't think it would matter so much for these cars because they're already so tiny, but having different tread really does change the handling characteristics of the car. Uh, if you have like the all season tires, they are actually a little bit grippier so you can make tighter turns and if you have the uh, slicks on them uh, in my experience anyway the cars tend to go a little bit faster but also tend to be more tail happy so if you want to try drifting these things you can certainly do that it's a little bit difficult to do um well to drift your cars or just have really any kind of precise control with the uh, original zip shafts because like i said they only have digital um, acceleration and steering um, but with the zip saps se's you can definitely have a lot of fun exploring the handling dynamics of these little cars now what else do you get so you get um, two sets of rims in here uh, for you to well i don't know you call them rims wheel covers yeah let's go with wheel covers uh, and you get three sets of gears so I don't know why, but every single upgrade set gives you an extra set of the blue gears, which you get in every single car. Um, and then you also get a set of green gears and red gears. Red gears are the uh, low torque, high speed gears. The blue gear is the high torque, low speed gears, and the green is kind of in the middle. And uh, I'll talk about how that works and all that with the, the motors as well. So in this set, you get two extra motors. You get a turbo speed motor, they call it, which has uh, 21,500 RPM, and a nitrous speed motor with 23,500 RPM. Now, the naming gets a little bit confusing because um, later on in the uh, Zipsaps SE line, which, you know, mostly the same stuff, so you also get all seasons. Uh, sport tires, two sets of hubcaps, two motors, three gear sets. The motors uh, have the same names, but they're different. So in this set, the turbo speed motor would, is 28,000 RPM, which is already much faster than the uh, turbo speed or even the nitrous speed here. Um, the nitrous speed, this time um, labeled as nitrous express, is 34,000 RPM, uh, which in a tiny car like this is actually pretty ridiculously fast. So uh, if you run the really fast motor on these cars, you'll want to have like a lot of space to be able to, you know, actually move the car around before you just start crashing into things. So in total, um, and here's a set with just of just motors and gear sets. Again, uh, green, blue, and red, which I'm currently using. In addition to the four motors that were listed, uh, you have so 16, 21, 5, 23, 5, 28, and then there's also 34. So there's five different types of motors. Um, the stock motor that is 16,000, that I don't actually know which cars come with it because all eight of the cars that I have came with the 21,500 RPM performance motor. The red gears, so the uh, high speed, low torque gears with the lowest RPM motor is my favorite combination because it makes the car accelerate the least aggressively, 
which makes them much more easy to control on any kind of small surface. And I have carpet in my home, so the only place where I can really play with these is on a desk. And when you're on a desk, you're going to want the cars to basically go as slow as possible so you have, you know, functionally more room to play with. To help you make your own circuits, there are also like cones and pylons that you can buy. Uh, this is called the Rally Course Racing Kit. It comes with some barrels and cones for you to set up a little kind of uh, autocross thing on a desk or something. Um, and this is the only one I bought. There is also a track wall set that lets you put down like continuous walls um, that go around into a circuit. If you're really competitive, you can also upgrade the circuit with a lap timer that can track your lap times and also uh, clock how fast the car goes through it. After that, everything else is basically just aesthetic. Uh, I think I collected most of the Fast and Furious sets and most certainly, well, everything that's interesting to me anyway in the, the uh, Zipsatch SE line. So there's this one that is the Eclipse and RX-7 that I already showed off. Um, you have this one from the uh, Too Fast, Too Furious, which has the Eclipse Spider, I believe, is that what it's called? And also uh, the green Evo that you see back there, Evo 7, I believe? Yes, Evo 7, yeah. The uh, motors and the gears are the same that come in basically all of the other sets. So this one also has the purple 34,000 RPM motor and the 28,000 RPM, which is called racing speed, but the initial D sets calls the uh, turbo speed. I uh, have here this set, which has Suki's um, S2000 and of course, uh, Paul's GTR. I forget what his actual name is in the movie, Paul Walker, but yeah, there you go. And here's another one that has the uh, orange Supra, even with the lines molded in for the target top, and a yellow Civic Si, uh, which I don't really know if it was actually in the movie or not. Maybe it was just like an, one of those anonymous crowd cars. Some of them definitely look a lot better than the other ones. Like for example, uh, this Supra, like compared to the uh, GTR obviously doesn't look as good, but the paint quality has been pretty consistent across all of them. And in terms of the SE sets, I already showed off this one, which has the uh, Levin and the Treno in it, which is pretty cool. Um, so there are a little, like a couple little inaccuracies. For example, like the Fujiwara Tofu Shop stamp, you see it is on the right side, but it's also on the left side. Um, but like, you know, the little shells look so adorable. Like I really can't get mad about that. Uh, I also have this set from, I guess it's called, well, Super Street Magazine, I guess they did this. Um, so it's a Integra, a DC2 Integra and a DC5 Integra. Uh, yeah, and the cool thing about these, you can see that the windows are black, but that's because these have underglow. <laughs> you can see there are an extra two LEDs attached to the board there on the top and some light piping that comes down along the sides. Uh, let me pop this on a car, show you what it looks like. You'll want to be a little bit careful with the connectors, but they seem to be uh, fairly sturdy. Ooh. Plug that in, thread the antenna, put the tabs in. And then once we turn on the car, there you go. You can see the uh, underglow kind of happening right there, but you can just barely see it on my hand right there, the underglow. Which is uh, really neat. Actually playing with these in the dark with all the lights off and you can only have the headlights from the cars running around is actually uh, really, really fun and nostalgic. The Super Street set also comes with some stickers that you can use to customize your cars. Uh, very, very Y2K decals. But you can tint the lights if you want. Uh, carbon fiber effect hood, stripes, uh, racing numbers. Yeah, it's all pretty neat. And the last one I have is this set, which I guess is 
probably one of the more boring sets because it doesn't really belong to anything, but it's just a um, Audi TT and a uh, Mercedes SL500 body. So yeah, it looked pretty nice. Although uh, the SL has a minor paint defect. You can't really see it through this, but there's a red mark on the door and I don't know how it got there. There are also um, a couple of weird things that they did. Like there is, I think a pair of Escalades that somehow play music, which I'm guessing has basically one of those like greeting card speakers inside of them. All the accessories you've seen so far are cross compatible between normal zip zaps and SEs. The only exception are the open top convertible shells. Uh, they fit on the normal zip zaps just fine because the top of the chassis is completely smooth. And you can see that it doesn't stick out too much, but the SE shells have all of this stuff and the plug for, uh, the, well, where the plug for the um, lights go. So they don't really fit underneath. Now you can pop the black interior piece thing out. It's just really not gonna work. Like um, at least on the S2000, you can see here it runs into this little, the tie down for the board and the antenna. And uh, yeah, so a little bit of a bummer that um, you can't use all of the parts. But as far as I know, there are only two of these kinds of shells, which is this one and the uh, Eclipse Spider. So it's not a huge loss. So after having covered all of that, how much does this all cost? I think ideally you'd want to buy cars that are sealed. Even though you're gonna have to deal with the corrosion inside of them, if you buy a sealed car, you'll know that first of all, all the parts are there, and second, that there aren't any non-corrosion related issues with the electronics for the most part. Um, if you buy any of these secondhand, well, first of all, there still might be corrosion because you don't know if the previous owners had ever actually used them with any regularity to prevent that. And secondly, there could be other damage that could be very annoying or impossible to fix. And you're certainly not gonna be able to get any kind of like information from the sellers for the most part because most people haven't done the research to know about what is or isn't working of about the little toy car that they're gonna sell. So right now on the marketplace, you can find sealed zip zaps, both regular ones and the SCs for roughly the same price range. Uh, and that's about 40 to maybe 60-ish dollars for most of them. Some of them uh, command quite high prices. For example, the initial D ones, um, I believe like there's like an FC that's still on eBay for like 75-ish dollars. I bought the pair of mine uh, from a guy that I managed to talk down from 150 for both the FD and the FC down to I think maybe 110, 120 or so. Still a little bit steep, um, and especially steep considering that both of the chassis that came with these cars don't work very well. Um, so that really sucks. But I do have two working ones now, so at least I have spares, I guess. As for the regular zip zaps, the, uh, <laughs> the Evos are, for some reason, like ridiculously expensive. The guy that I bought the pair, um, this one from the yellow one, and also the uh, silver one in a pair. I managed to talk him down from I think it was almost three hundred dollars for both of them, and the uh, Fast and Furious two set down to one sixty. Um, still eight, still eighty bucks per car, and I guess the accessory set thrown on top. But you know. <laughs> they're not exactly cheap if you want the desirable models. But for cheaper models like the Z, you can probably find one for maybe 50 or so. The Viper and GT40, these are both really cheap. Um, this one was $40 and this I managed to talk the guy down to 30. And that is really nice because these are also you know late production cars that probably have the least amount of possible manufacturing faults and defects. Now, as for which one is better, you kind of have a trade-off. So for SEs, you get more functionality, 
but the cars themselves are inherently more fragile. And also the batteries. So these, you have to buy that very specific battery that I mentioned earlier, the Dantona, which doesn't fit that great and is also a pretty penny. The pair of batteries that I got for these two cars cost me $35 with shipping. Um, that's almost the whole price of a whole other car. On the other hand, I bought a pack of five one third AAA flat top batteries for all four of the regular zip zaps and that was only $18. So regular zip zaps, cheaper batteries, lower functionality, SEs, higher functionality, more expensive batteries, but both roughly the same buy in price. Either way you go, um, as long as you have a delicate hand and you can replace the batteries, you can have a ton of fun with these even in 2024. Like, it's really sad that right now there's basically nobody in the remote control car market that makes anything at this size that is as like fully featured. Um, like the fact that this is basically all we have is really sad. There's also these like 170-ish scale uh, like little drift car things, um, but they're quite a bit more expensive. Like the floor price for one of those, I think is like $80 and they're not really customizable at all. So yeah, sometimes you go on a nostalgia trip and it doesn't pay off, but this time I revisited a toy from my childhood and it turned out to be absolutely amazing. So maybe you got something out of that. Maybe you learned something. Maybe you'll buy one of your own or maybe you won't. Either way, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.